Hey Luke here with CatsandCarp.com and I'm going to show you how to get into blacksmithing. I'm going to show you how to build your own wood burning forge. I'm going to show you my anvil setup and how to make one yourself. And I'm going to show you how to make a set of these blacksmithing tongs. This will be your first project. Really easy. They're made from rebar and an important piece of equipment if you're going to get into blacksmithing. This whole setup cost me about 200 bucks and that's probably what it'll cost you depending on what you have lying around the house and what tools you already have so if you do it right if you're able to use stuff you already have uh, you could do it even cheaper than that but this is a great setup this isn't a real fly-by-night right, setup this is this is a pretty legitimate beginner forge first off I'm gonna show you how I built the forge I'm gonna go through the whole process there I'm gonna show you the anvil I'll set up and I'm going to show you how to make the tongs. All right, so let me give you kind of a rundown of what I'm going to be building. Let me show you the design. Now this furnace is a wood burning furnace. It runs off of charcoal or wood scraps. You can also use coal if you want. And it's powered by a shop vac. So the shop vac is blowing air into the furnace. You can also use a hair dryer. You could use a hand uh, blower, specialty blacksmithing blowers. Um, but this is what I had around the house and it works really good. But hair dryers work pretty well too. So let me give you a little example here. Look at that. Now I'm using lumber scraps and wood, but if you use coal, uh, I hear that it gets even hotter and it works a little bit better. You don't have to stoke it as often and it uh, burns a little bit hotter. So if you can source coal and, and use that instead, that's a great option. The great thing about these wood burning forges is you can use just about anything to make them. I use sheet steel here, but you know, I could have, uh, used this uh, helium canister, cut it in two and use it. You can use the, a barbecue shell. Um, you can you could use a metal trash can probably. I mean, in just about anything uh, will work if you insulate it where, well enough. The thing is, is that sand is a fabulous insulator. And so as long as you have a good layer of sand um, on top of the steel and the fires high up, you shouldn't have any problem. There is almost zero heat being transferred down. So as long as the fire rides high up on the furnace, the metal doesn't get heated up. This is cold, okay? Um, everything but the very rim of the metal is cold to the touch. And then you basically have some sort of base to put it on. And I've got a, um, a frame made out of two by fours. And I've got a little work area here with a, a vise, and I've got a little place to hang my tools. Um, if you're worried about fire and about charring it, you can sprinkle sand on top of this, and it acts as a little bit of a fire safe, a little fire or guard. Okay, so the first step in my forge project is I'm going to put holes in this pipe. Now this is a two inch heavy gauge black steel pipe, okay? This is heavy duty stuff. It's about a three foot section. It was a scrap out of the plumbing section at Home Depot. And I've got to put some holes along the edge. So this is some pretty heavy duty drilling. So I've got a half inch uh, Milwaukee cobalt uh, drill bit. So this is a pretty heavy duty drill bit designed for drilling through metal. That's one hole, and now I'm going to try to put them down every uh, few inches. There you go, six holes. Oh, man, I knew this drill bit is just about shot. Whoa. Oh, yeah, the nose on that thing is ground down. Now let's see if we can squeak out one more hole. Well, I decided to punch seven holes in the pipe and give it a little bit more airflow, a little less pressure, and uh, hopefully that'll work. Let's test this sucker out, see how our airflow is.
I'm welding the sheet steel together with an 80 amp arc welder from Harbor Freight. It runs off a 120 volt outlet and it is so weak, it barely could handle the 16 gauge uh, steel. But what do you expect from a $150 arc welder that runs off a 120 volt outlet? You know, you kind of can't expect too much. Oh, these are ugly, ugly welds. Before welding, I need to cut a hole in the end piece to fit the two inch pipe. So I'm tracing it with a Sharpie and you can see here it's a circle, but I'm just gonna cut a square piece out of the corner. You can see there's another square piece out of the corner. That's where I screwed it up before. So this was my uh, do over. But you can see there, once you get it right, it fits pretty snugly and leaves a nice hole for the pipe to, to go in. Well, I may be the worst welder ever, and this may be the worst welding machine ever, but we actually did it. I think this will uh, actually hold up. Oh, it's so ugly. I don't even want to show you a close up. The design criteria of this forge isn't very uh, rough. It needs to be strong enough to hold about 60 pounds of gravel and the holes need to be in about the middle of the forge and you want the pipe to fit in snugly enough that pea gravel doesn't fall out the hole on the side. If you do all that, you should be fine. So now I'm gonna get started on the base. There's a million different ways to do this and a lot of different materials you could have used, but this is how I did it. I cut up four pieces of two foot lengths and four pieces of four foot length and I'm using them to make a two foot by two foot by four foot box essentially with two layers of shelves. So I mark off the top and bottom uh, shelf where I want it at and start hammering it away. Now I put each shelf a foot from the end but in hindsight I would have put the top shelf a little bit closer to the end of the four foot post. <laughs> oh my son is so cute. Look at that. Next you need to get the cross members. So two of the cross members will be two foot sections and the other two will be three foot sections and they'll make your little workspace. I'm using nails. You could use exterior deck screws, which would be a lot stronger. I'm popping about two nails per each joint just to be safe, but a lot of different ways you can do this. If I did it over again, I'd probably would have used treated lumber too, instead of just plain. For the decking, I'm using two foot lengths and I'm leaving a three inch gap in the top shelf. That's where the forge is going to slide in and fit. Um, on the bottom shelf, just kind of put in it however you can, you know, make the decking. And you can see here that the forge fits snugly in that little three inch gap. It's nice and cozy. But when you're ready to start forging, make sure it's level. Um, trim off any wood that sticks above the lip of the forge so it doesn't catch on fire. And once you got that all done, you're ready to fire this bad boy up and test it out. So just put some mud in there and that'll keep air from getting out of this end. I'm using pea gravel instead of pure sand because pea gravel allows more airflow. It diffuses the air and keeps it from just coming up where the holes are. And you want to make sure you put down enough pea gravel that the rocks don't go flying up like you just saw. Um, if I had to do it over again, I would have added a lot more pea gravel and a lot less sand. But you can see here, once you get it full, you can see uh, the air is still popping up, still plenty of air coming through, and you can feel it with your hand, and you can see it as how it affects the fire. I'll tell you what, that test run worked pretty good. It fired right up and we got a lot of air going through there, even with the sand covering up the uh, vents. It's cold down here. 
where the sand is. Any part that's covered with sand is good. Now it's a little lopsided, so this part is exposed. There's no sand, and I can see where it's warped and bent a little bit. I don't think it's caused any permanent damage to it, but I think what I need to do is once it cools down, I need to level it out and make sure that the metal's not uh, not exposed, that all the, the metal's covered with sand. And I think we're ready to go. Now I just need to, to mount my anvil and uh, we'll go from there. This, this is a $35 vise I got at Harbor Freight. Just put it on the uh, bench there and mark the half inch holes with a Sharpie. Then drill them out with a half inch drill bit. And then I've got two and a half inch long, half inch diameter machine screws with lock nuts and just put it down in there, pound and force them through and tighten it up and we're good to go. Then I went through the woods to look for a piece of oak for my anvil. I think uh, this might do the trick. Oh. Well, it's a bit low and it's uneven on one end. Whoa. So I'd have to trim it like right about there. <laughs> I don't know if I made it better or worse. Enough. Once I got the end of the stump flush, I drilled holes in the corner of the anvil and put in three inch, half inch diameter lag screws, the big old bolts. Tapped them in and then used a socket wrench to, to tighten them down and that took some time. Uh, half a bubble off block, just like me. Okay, for fuel, I'm using charcoal, and I've got charcoal that's just left over from my fireplace and from forging the night before. And you can buy or make charcoal. It comes in these chunks, but you want it big, chunky stuff. You want hardwood charcoal. Or you can get pieces of wood. So just, you want chunks. Little chunks like this. You know, scraps from uh, this and that. These little two by four chunks work really well. I like these best, just about this length. But um, you can also use coal, uh, not charcoal, but you know, legitimate coal. Okay, it's time for your first blacksmithing project. You're gonna make yourself a pair of blacksmithing tongs, a really essential blacksmithing tool. So let's crank this fire up. Doesn't take much to get it started. Once it's burning, it, within about three to five minutes, it's ready for smithing. And you can see here, everything's nice and got a charcoal coating on it. That's when you're ready to go. And I've got two 24 inch pieces of number four rebar, which are half inch diameter rebar. And I'm sticking the last eight inches in the hottest part of the fire. And I'm letting them sit there for about three to five minutes. And then they'll start to turn a cherry red and uh, this is what we're going to do. The first strike is going to be about six inches from the end and you're just going to beat only one side of the iron. Do not flip it over. Just pound it on one side and then once it cools down put it in and grab the other one and switch on and off. While you're beating on one the other one's cooking and while the other one's cooking you're beating on the other one and so forth. And so what you're doing is you, you want it to be flat on one side. Uh, this is the offset for the connected pivot portion of the, uh, the tongs. Then you want to flatten out the tip to make the, the teeth of the tongs. And you want it to be 90 degrees from the offset. Then uh, keep stoking this bad boy. That's the one downside to charcoal forges is you constantly have to feed them. But you gotta keep that fire hot and roaring. So, Next, what we're going to do is take a pair of vice grips and grab the flat part, the offset, and then use the hammer to make sure that the tip is 90 degrees to the flat spot. You want it to be exactly 90 degrees, so really eyeball that carefully. And you want about a good three inches of flat teeth, but this is, you know, up to your preference. 
Now test the two pieces together and kind of imagine, say, well, you know, are these going to work together? And then tweak and adjust. You can see here my offset portion wasn't long enough. So once you got it, it should look a little bit like this, and then you're ready to bend the jaws. So what you do is I use a, um, a one inch mason stake or some round piece of, of sturdy steel and just beat it over the edge of that to give it the nice curve. And then put them together and make sure they kind of match. And now you want to get those teeth to go together really well. So sandwich them together and beat them so that they connect flush with each other. And just really watch that and, and get that to line up exactly. And you can use the vice grips to help you with this. But once you got it, it should look like this, and you can kind of uh, test them out and make sure they feel right. And then you're done with the forging part. You're ready to drill the holes and set the rivets. Yeah, I used up a little more than half the charcoal and uh, half the pile. Um, probably been doing this about an hour and a half, two hours. So quite a bit of fuel course I'm not very good at this and so you know if I had to do it over again I think I could have done it much quicker and used much less fuel but you know it's the way it goes. The two sides of the tong are connected with a rivet and you're gonna drill a quarter inch hole in both of the ends of the tong where you want them to connect. You're gonna need a heavy-duty high-quality drill bit to do this and the thinner you beat that connecting portion, the easier it is to drill. So keep that in mind. You're kind of balancing strength with how hard it is to drill it. And you'll burn through a bit just doing two of these holes. Um, you can punch a hole using blacksmithing tools, but that's a, a little bit trickier. And uh, so when you're first starting out, you might just want to drill it at first. Then you take a quarter inch piece of weldable steel and you put it in the hole and cut off a little chunk and fit it through. Make sure it actually fits, pound it through, and you should have a little bit sticking out on both ends. And you want to trim it up so that there's only like a sixteenth of an inch of peg sticking out of the hole on either side. Then what you're going to do is you're going to smack that peg and mushroom it on both sides and that'll keep it from coming it out. If you're keeping it from coming out. Do this on an anvil rather than on the floor of your garage. I don't know why I did it this way, but and then you take a smaller hammer or a ball peen hammer and kind of mushroom the edges. You want the ends of the rivet to be wider than the middle. And once you do it, test it out and it should work pretty smoothly. And, and just, it's a very, very strong and accurate tool. And this tool is an absolute necessity if you want to do things like knife making or forging anything other than long bars. Well, I had a great time making this video. I had a great time doing this project. I hope you learned something and enjoyed it too. We put out new videos every week, so please click subscribe to get our videos and like this video and leave comments about what other projects you'd like to see us do. And if you'd like to see more videos from the Catfish and Carp YouTube channel, check out these videos. We have lots of great videos, including this awesome do-it-yourself catch a live squirrel trap and I've got a fun video where I beat the dickens out of an ugly stick fishing rod and see how much abuse it can take. I'll put a link in the description to both these videos and thanks for watching.